Welcome to the 200th episode, the official 200th episode of Fermented Adventure, the podcast. We want to thank everyone who has joined us on this journey. We've made some wonderful friends. We visited some wonderful places and we have met some tremendously fantastic, fabulous people on our Fermented Adventure journey. So today we celebrate our 200th episode. On this day, our hearts, our prayers, our thoughts are with those in Georgia, Florida, the Carolinas, Tennessee, and Virginia who are dealing with the devastation that has come to their communities. Please do reach out. Please do come together and support those that really need our help right now. It's not just the distilleries, cideries, meaderies, breweries, wineries, those connected with the industry that we love so much. It's all these people that really need our help right now. So while we celebrate, we'll be thinking about you. Cheers! Hello, ladies and gentlemen, craft spirit enthusiasts, and those interested in the intoxicating world of craft distilleries, cideries, meaderies, wineries, and the occasional foray into breweries. It's Rich Sheen, and welcome to Fermented Adventure, the podcast, where we bring you the fascinating people that are making the mash, fermenting, distilling, bottling, pouring, and delivering to you some of the finest libations in the world. Before we get started, here are a few housekeeping items. Thank you for bringing the podcast into wherever you are and whatever you're doing. We truly are grateful that you've chosen to listen and make us part of your day. It would mean the world to us if you left a five-star review. This helps us climb in the rankings, and it makes it easier for others to find us. Don't hesitate to leave us your comments as well. If the podcast didn't meet your expectations, tell us why. We're always striving to improve. You can find us at fermentedadventure.com. We are on Instagram and Facebook as Fermented Adventure. Email us at fermentedadventure at gmail.com. All right, FA Nation, let's meet our guests. We're here at Asbury Park Distilling Company. She's Kelly Bodner. I'm Rich Shane. Dawn Ranieri's here, and this is Fermented Adventure, the podcast. Kelly, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. All right. I told you when we got here, we were over the top excited. This is our official 200th podcast. So thank you. We couldn't have asked for one of the special distilleries to us. We have been coming here for us, we figured out, since August of 2018. Wow. And... We've wanted to sit down and learn about Asbury Park Distilling more from just being customers at the bar. How did Asbury Park Distilling get started? There's a group of owners that decided they wanted to start a distillery in downtown Asbury Park because the vibes here are really great and there's good foot track of traffic. Um, we opened our doors in 2017, Memorial Day weekend. The first thing we got was a sill. The second thing we got was a master distiller, <laughs> which was not me. It was um, Bill Tambusi. Um, he really is kind of the mastermind behind a lot of the products that we have today. We wouldn't have Asbury Park Distilling Company if it wasn't for him. Um, but yeah, so they brought him on and we opened our doors Memorial Day 2017. We had two spirits, vodka and gin, that was it. Um, and since then we've grown pretty significantly. Yeah, for the longest time, we've experienced the gin and the vodka and the whole cocktail program. And I think for us, the cocktail program is what introduced us to craft cocktails and the bartenders were creating these wonderful amazing cocktails and that is still in existence today the cocktails are first rate they're some of the best cocktails what was it though i mean you talk about the foot traffic and you talk about the vibe were the and are the founders from asbury so neither of the founders are from asbury one of them has ties to Asbury because his uh, grandmother owned a hotel where like the Ocean Club is now. Um, I don't remember the name of the hotel, but uh, so he owned it. He had kind of like memories of coming here kind of back before the crime rate really went up. Um, but <laughs> but the, there's been a big resurgence in Asbury Park. There's been a lot of development that's happened. Lots of restaurants coming in here, lots of bars. Um, it's always had a huge history of art and music. Um, there's a lot of history of bootlegging here too. There's like underground vaults throughout the city, which is kind of crazy. 
Have you Allegedly. gotten to any of those vaults? I haven't been in. I haven't been in. One of our bartenders says he's been in them, but okay. I haven't been in. Um, but yeah, so there's like a lot of history here, a lot of culture, and I think that they were just kind of inspired by that. I think the craft cult, the craft cocktail scene really popped off here. Like you can get a great cocktail in a bunch of places here. I, we're not. We're certainly not the only ones. Um, but it was really important to us that we have a way to showcase our spirits. It's more accessible to people than just drinking street liquor. <laughs> um, and that's kind of like where that, that started. We've been really blessed to have some really great people come through here. It's really, really talented, creative people that have made some really awesome cocktails. Um, and we've learned kind of from them too. So like, we're not just making spirits and they're figuring out how to make them taste good in cocktails we're also learning from the way that spirits are made in cocktails like how that tastes and letting that kind of inform when we're making new products so okay so like if i'm if i'm making it or if i'm making an adjustment to the gin am i showcasing that juniper is it going to come through in the right way when we put it in a cocktail so we've learned kind of from each other i'm glad you shared that because for Dawn and I, I think that's one of the things that we felt right away from the cocktails, that it was a partnership. It wasn't, well, we have a gin, so we need to make gin and tonics and things like that. We have a vodka, so we'll make these just vodka cocktails. There was really a sense from the beginning of what we experienced, a balance, that people were working together that people were thinking together. And even, I guess, coming down to the botanicals of what we're doing in the percentages to uh, affect cocktails, that's something that was always part of the conversation as, as you're describing. Yeah, I think it's always been kind of a, a big part of the what's going on here is that we know the things that we know and we know the things that other people might be a little bit stronger on and so we've always tried to be collaborative and we've always tried to, to kind of learn from each other about like what someone else might know a little bit more about cocktails or understand that a little bit more and so that's always kind of been a conversation i also come from hospitality i come from bartending so like it definitely like influences decisions i make um but yeah it's always been a, a collaborative conversation here. Um, I think that's a, like a really important part of like the creative process is to have community and to be able to like grow together. So. All right, so your experience in hospitality, in bartending, mm -hmm. talk about how that influences what you do today. We'll talk about you being a master distiller here and how you got here, but you said that. This is my experience. This is how this I I impacts what I do. How does that work with you today? Yeah, so I feel like when you're in the hospitality industry, I've been serving since I was 17 years old. Um, I like, worked at like an Indian food restaurant. I probably served like two tables a week because it was mostly takeout. But like I, I've been doing it for a really long time. Um, and I, I think you learn a lot of work, work ethic through that and attention to detail and that's definitely something that translates to the work you do in the I do in the back like everything's very labeled and meticulous and done in a certain way um, and I think that that definitely comes from like the things that you learn working in restaurants um, and I also think that like building a cocktail and your fl your balancing flavors that kind of that experience of doing that on a micro level over and over and over again helps you try to balance flavors when you're like working on maybe a blend for a bourbon or when you're working on a new recipe and you're like, oh, it's missing a little bit of like sweet or sour or whatever flavor it kind of needs. Um, I think that that, I think a lot of that comes from like my experience making cocktails in, in bars. Yeah, you're, you're thinking in your head even as whatever is being produced is coming off the still. And that's really fun because we've, I've, I've talked about this with Matt Greif of Modern Art Distillery that in a lot of ways, and, and I think we had this conversation too with uh, American Metal Whiskey, that the palette is created and then you add the medium. So the medium or the paints or the medium is whatever you're going to put on that palette base, right? But you, as the master distiller, start to think, as that's coming off the still, how am I making that paint? How am I creating now what is going to be this wonderful tapestry? This You talk about art. 
and in the, the history of here in Asbury Park, well, you get to be one of those people that actually gets to make what is going into the artistry of somebody else. And having that in your mindset, that's pretty powerful. That's pretty, that's pretty, it's it just, now you, now you kind of get a better sense of what you do every day. Yeah. No, no, I think it's important to like think about the way that people are are going to enjoy the spirits and not just making something that's good and tastes good, but like how are people going to have it? Um, and like I think being a versatile spirit is really something that's important to us. Approachability is something that's really important to us. Like it might be really cool, but a little too niche and then it's not really for us. There's there's plenty, plenty of things that we can make and that we have tried to make that have just been a little bit too weird so we're like maybe this isn't a product for our brand um but yeah like you got to think about like the way that it's going to be used and the way that it's going to get watered down and what that's going to do the flavor and all that you spoke about your early indian restaurant experiences (laughs) how did it come to be that you're not just serving you're not just bartending but you're now a master distiller how did that journey happen for you yeah, so I, I really only worked at the Indian food restaurant for maybe like a summer. Um, and then I turned 18 and I could work in full service restaurants. Um, so I got a job when I was 18 uh, at a, an Irish place in Massachusetts. Um, and it was the first time I was serving alcohol. And the thing is, is that people are going to ask you your opinion about it, whether or not you can actually legally drink it. So it actually built this like habit in me where I had to go and I had to research it. So I'm like on the brand websites trying to figure out like, what is white Zinfandel? (laughs) You know what I mean? I don't know. I'm an 18 year old and I don't have access to that. So, um, I, I would research a lot. I have notebooks full of like trying to kind of, kind of figure it all out. Like, what is this? How is it made? So that I would be able to explain it to people when I was serving it. Uh, Because I don't like being asked a question that I can't answer. Um, That's just like something in me. And even when I turned 21 and I could try new things, like I, you know, in restaurant jobs that I've had down here in New Jersey, I still kind of was like looking up every beer that's on the menu, every wine that's on the menu. I want to know about it. I want to be able to explain it to people. If people have a question, I always like to be prepared. And I think that really brought me like, I got, I mean, I got down a rabbit hole learning about how things were made and, and reading magazines and all sorts of stuff. So I think that really like kind of was what got me interested in how to, how spirits are made. Um, and then, yeah, I went to a distillery tour in Nashville when I was there for the solar eclipse and in 2017. And I was like, my jaw was like on the floor the whole time because I didn't realize that this was like, like I, I didn't really understand fully, like this is a job. This is how people make products like this. Um, and I remember afterwards I was talking to the girl and asked, she had she had gotten a degree in fermentation science and then kind of gone into the industry. And I was like, how do I do that? Do I go back to school? Where are there programs? And she was like, get experience, like get hands-on experience. Um, and so I, made a list of all the distilleries that were near me and Asbury Park is alphabetically first <laughs> so I came here um, and and talked my like all the bartenders ears off right like I they had to take shifts talking to me because they were like we're trying to close what's this girl doing but they gave me the business card of our master distiller and uh I went home with a bottle of barrel finished gin and I wrote him an email that said, I, I, I want to learn about this. Like I, I've, I'm at my end. Like I can't figure out where to go from here other than just like, will you hire me? I'll mop the floors, whatever you want to do. Um, and yeah. And then that's kind of like how I get started here. Um, that sounds so serendipitous and the path that you were supposed to be on you just needed to see the path expose itself as you walked. Had you not gone to Nashville for a solar eclipse, you wouldn't have gone to the distillery tour. You wouldn't have met somebody that gave you that direction because you're right. When you look at, and you see the stills today, the first time you looked at them, I'm sure you had this look of whether it was Nashville or here, how does all that work? Mm -hmm. All that copper, all that tubing, 
all that stuff, those big shiny vat things, what, what happens there, it's overwhelming. And you kind of flash, you, you shine a flashlight on the path. Oh, we'll get hands-on experience. All right, let's see. A, Asbury, it's right there. I'm not too far away. And people were willing to sit down or people were willing to talk to you to give you that direction. And somebody was willing to say, hey, come on in. I'm going to give you a start, not knowing whether that was going to be a long-term thing. Once you got behind this glass wall and once you got into the still, how did that feel for you? And you know, the, the next steps to where you are today? Yeah, so I was still bartending when I first started here, mostly because they couldn't afford a second distiller. It's a small business, right? So like it, we've, we've grown, but we've grown very stepwise. It's been very like, what's the next right thing to do? Um, and so I started working here in the mornings and then going to a bartending job in Red Bank and just uh, hustle, like getting as many hours here as I could and then doing the bartending thing so that I could pay all my bills. Um, but every day, like honestly, like as many hours as I could get was I was trying to be here. Um, it was kind of like coming it was like the first day of school like every day you know like you're learning something new I probably annoyed the life out of Bill for a couple years of just like well so how does this work and and so what is this and um you learn a lot of that but yeah like I just asked a million questions and eventually I wanted to learn more on like an academic level so I'm actually like part-time in a food science program at Rutgers and now it's kind of like reverse engineering like where <laughs> uh, you learn about things and it kind of sounds like alchemy but then when you go back to school and you take an organic chemistry class you're like oh that's like a class of chemical compounds that's not just like a word for something that smells good yeah so it, yeah it's been like a, an interesting journey like kind of learning things in kind of reverse. But that's fascinating because that's what I'm thinking that we speak to many distillers who were chemists first. Mm -hmm. You become a distiller and now you're learning how to be a chemist. So it's, it's that reverse order that you spoke about. But I think that whether you laid down the base of the chemistry, you laid, you laid down the base of the production, now, now both make sense. Mm -hmm. Now help you understand why you marry the two and they come together to produce spirits in a bottle for you. But now you've taken over the reins and now this is all yours. And, and, and you get to make the decisions and you get to make the cuts. Um, you talk about that. So, you know, again, for Dawn and I, it was gin and it was vodka. And then you see on social media, we're releasing our, our barrel aged, our first barrel aged. And it's like, all right. We, we've got to, you know, whatever we're doing, we're not doing that anymore because we're coming for the release or just to try something we, we've been waiting on this time. And then, you know, then you start to see the trickle of the bourbon that, that that's coming out. Uh, we're going to sample that a little bit. And you talked about the slow growth process, the step by step being intentional upon that. Where has that been? Talk about the unfolding of this small distillery here in Asbury Park and how it's growing and the next steps of, uh, you know, where you are and where you're growing to. Yeah, so we've been making bourbon since the start. Um, and like when you say you're making bourbon, people are like, oh, so when it's going to be ready. And that's one of the biggest things you have, you learn that I've learned being a distiller is you have to have patience for things. You have to just like kind of like let things unfold as they need to. Um, and I think a lot of people feel not a lot of people but like I feel like sometimes it's easy to feel the pressure of like we got to put a product out and so sometimes you release something before it's ready and we really wanted to avoid that so um we ended up doing the contract route and we have a contract bourbon which we love and it's great and it's kind of like it's like a stepchild of ours you know um but it, we really did that to make sure that we could create the space and the time that we need in order to, to age whiskey um and originally we aged all of our whiskey like in this distillery and it's not a big space. We had like over a hundred barrels, like you couldn't see through the windows anymore because there was just stacks and stacks and stacks everywhere. There was like a big rack of barrels that were in the windows on the, the street side. Like if you looked from the outside, it would look like the only thing that was back there was barrels. You wouldn't even know that there was a still really. 
Um, and so, like, we kind of started to outgrow. There was a point in time where whenever we got a, um, or whenever we got a bottle shipment, it would take up the entirety of our production space. And for, our, for us to do anything, we would have to roll the barrel, the, all of the bottles outside. So only th certain things can go out onto the street because it's a bonded space. So we can't like move anything that has alcohol. We can only move like the bottles. So we'd have to like roll all the bottles out onto the street just to get like access to this tote so that we could blend this, so that we could bottle this. And it's been kind of like a, it's kind of like a little puzzle where like the one piece is missing and you're trying to make the picture. Um, so it's definitely like, there's definitely some growing pains with that. And uh, last year around, April, which is around the time when Bill left and I took over as master distiller, um, we moved into a warehouse and we moved all 100 of our barrels over to a warehouse, which is a little less than a mile away. Um, and we put in bigger fermenters and we put in bigger storage tanks. And that's been like kind of the biggest move that we've made. Um, but it has just been like a slow, progressive, like, okay, we're doing two barrels this month and we're doing <laughs> two barrels next month. and. Um, kind of slowly growing that way until it gets to a point where we're like we're bursting at the seams. We have to make, and we have to make the next move. So. That's why this is fun for us mm -hmm. because we learn through the process, and you don't see everything that people do day in and day out. I remember seeing all the barrels in the window, and I can only imagine what that must have been like. But understanding as you describe it, you're taking pieces of puddle. All right, all right, we've got to do, we're, we're bottling today. Which barrels are we using? And then pulling them from somewhere. And now you've got to make space for the next two barrels. So to hear now that you've been able to move the barrels out, create a larger production space, and this becomes that next step, it gives you the ability now to say, all right, we've got our flagships. Maybe we can play a little bit more. Maybe we up the production a little bit more. And we see where that next growth is gonna come from. Is it distribution? Is it building out a larger cocktail program? All these things I'm sure that have been discussed, but it's fun to hear your experience to something we never get to see, but the growth of somebody, like you said, your favorite stepchild or your favorite child. I mean, <laughs> for, for Asbury Park, this is one of our favorite you know, children to see it grow and to still see it expand. We remember um, COVID when you were just doing the ready to drink cocktails and you literally could walk up to the door here and there was a little rope or something to keep you from coming in the distillery, but we were handed canned cocktails. And uh, so, you know, Dawn and I went there and we just were walking around and enjoying the canned cocktails. And that was our Asbury Park distilling experience during COVID because it was all closed, but we wanted to have some things that we missed at the time. Um, the cocktails that you make and just all the flavors that we weren't getting a chance to enjoy. Yeah, that was an interesting time. Um, so like I didn't, my, my COVID experience was business as usual because, you know, everything, the liquor stores were still open. People were still buying alcohol more so actually for some people we had a pretty good distribution during covid um and i i don't say that to like take to belittle anything that was happening at the time obviously it was like a, a very scary time and there was a lot going on but um i was driving here every day and going to work like usual um just maybe wearing a mask like wearing a mask while i was doing it you know but we did um rtd cocktails and that was like an interesting thing to kind of figure out because you have to try and make them a little bit more shelf stable in case people are going to grab them. So we were like playing around with that was a big part of that was a time when we really, really collaborated. Like we were working side by side with the bartenders because they needed hours and they, they needed work. And so um, we were working with them a lot on those RTDs, um, trying to figure out the formulations to kind of figure out. So if you were gonna shake the cocktail, how much are you gonna water it down when it's just in a bottle and you're just chilling it? Um, so that was kind of an interesting collaborative time. But I remember that. I remember putting the, the little rope up in front of the, the door and selling right at the... the yeah, and, and let's not re ever have to do that again. Oh, I hope not. Yes. Now, why don't we take a break? and we come back, we're gonna taste through some of the expressions yeah. that Asbury Park Distilling produces and talk more about the spirits. Okay, awesome. Pardon the interruption. 
Thank you so much for listening to Fermented Adventure, the podcast. Could you do us a favor? Hit that follow button. It makes it easier for others to find us, and it helps us climb in the rankings. Take a screenshot of the podcast, post it, tag us, and let everyone know that you listen to the Fermented Adventure podcast. Now, back to our podcast. We're back, and we have these wonderful glasses in front of us. Um, I'm, I'm excited to share through these as we've been customers here but have not gotten the full tasting description experience of, of each individual spirit. We have the first one, which is your flagship gin. And talk about, like, you've come here. Is this the same mash bill? Is this the same everything since it started? Or have there been changes and tweaks to the recipe of this gin? So there's been a little bit of a tweak since the very beginning. Um, when. Bill first came here, he had an idea for a gin, and that was like the first thing that he made was our gin. Um, It took him a few iterations to get to where we were when we opened. Um, And then, you know, after a little bit of time and a little reflection and seeing how it played out in cocktails, um, he decided he wanted to up the juniper a little bit. So he did tweak a little bit the, the amount of botanicals, but the botanicals themselves, what we're using, has been the same the whole time. Um, so that's, we're using juniper, coriander, uh, borage, angelica, lemongrass, fresh cut lemongrass, cardamom, uh, sweet orange peel, which has a lot less terpenes than the bitter orange peel that's in um, like London dry gins, which I think contributes a lot to why it's not so piney, um, and then lemon peel. So it's a citrusy approachable version of gin um i think one of the things that we are the most proud of is that people come here and they taste their gin and they go well i don't usually like gin um but we like yours so that's our favorite compliment that that is high praise yeah and you know everything you talked about with the nose it's wonderfully spicy and it's wonderfully citrus it's wonderfully citrusy and it's wonderfully sweet on the nose. And there's also this um, this wonderful, it's almost like a minty quality and there's also some honey aspects. I have no idea what borage does. Borage is a, it's like also called star flower. It's giving that, that herbaceousness. If you get like a little bit of a cucumber note, which some people do when they drink our gin, that's where that's coming from. Um, yeah, I, it's like a, like it's a really like herbaceous, it's a flower, so it's, it's got a little bit of floralness to it, but I think it's, that's probably that menthol, it's probably a little bit of that, maybe a little bit of cardamom. As you nose this, it gives you a certain experience. And then the flavor profile, one of the things you hit on just as I was sipping was that cucumber melon aspect of the gin, mm-hmm. the sweetness of the gin, the where there, there's this wonderful perfume and this floralness to this gin. And, you know, being that you opened in 2017, New Jersey still in itself, the distilling, the craft distilling industry wasn't, you're one of the original distilleries in all of New Jersey, certainly not the oldest, but you're influencing people that haven't had this style of craft gin. And it's interesting to me how there's still people that come to here for the first time that have a perception of what gin is because they've had these old, as you pointed out, London dry style, but haven't had craft. And you you start to change their palates, you change their mind. Yeah, I mean, New Jersey has only had craft distilling since 2013 is when the craft license uh, started. And uh, before that, it was just Laird's um, who's been here, like they're one of the oldest in the country, if not the oldest in the country. but yeah, like I feel like a lot of people have had bad experiences with gin. They're taking it from their parents' liquor like, closet or too many G&Ts on a night out in college or whatever. And I think flavor is like so, so much what happens in your brain. Like, yeah, you're, you're mechanically tasting it with your tongue and you're smelling it and you're chemically smelling it. But how that's processed is so tied to our memories. And so like I think a lot of the time people come with like almost their guard up um, about gin because of these past experiences that they carry with them. Um, But I think like making it 
the thing that people are the most apprehensive about when it comes to gin is that like piney Christmas tree thing, and that all comes from the terpenes from the juniper particularly, but also I think the bitter orange really like plays into that. So I think if you play that down a little bit and you have like the brightness of the citrus and the lemongrass, like I think that makes it a little bit more approachable, um, a little bit like easier for people. And honestly, like this is the first gin that I ever had that I was like, oh, I could drink that on rocks, you know? Um, I think a lot of the time you get like that harsh. Well, there are a ton of great gins out there now, but I think like when we first started in 2017, like, you know, they weren't as popular. They weren't as, accept- like, people didn't have access to them as much, so. Well, being this is our 200th anniversary podcast, mm-hmm. for Dawn and I, our origination story came out of drinking craft gin. We had that same, our guard is up, as you said, and we didn't like gin. We didn't want to drink gin, but we tried it, and it was a gateway to say, all right, can't wait to see Asbury Distilling and Asbury Park Distilling because they have gin and we like gin now. So we can't wait to see what their take is on this gin. As we sip here, I am enjoying, there's, there's this wonderful bitterness that lingers, mm-hmm. but then just kind of allows for the oils of the citrus just to, just to stay. So there's a lot of complexity to this. Um, And there's a balance between a heavier viscosity and a thinness, which I think probably goes into where you want to be when you're creating a craft cocktail program. Yeah, definitely. I think that's the sweetness that you're talking about and that like viscosity, like we think that it comes from the fact that we're using corn GNS to make it. It's funny that you used the analogy of like a canvas and paint because that's literally the way I was taught about to think about GNS is like you want a blank canvas to make your gin on so you want it to be as neutral as possible when you start um, which is why we started using GNS in the first place. Um, that's just one kind of mentality on making gin but like it's it's really funny that you use that metaphor because that's like very similar to how I thought I learned to think about gin. Um, but yeah, that corn gives it like a little bit of sweetness and body. We're not, we're just going from pot to condenser when we're making our gin. So we're not putting it through our column. And I think because the column kind of, it was one of the first iterations that, that Bill did is he tried to put it through the column and it just got really flat. Or I, I've been told, yeah, I wasn't here for that. Um, but it got really flat and it was just like very dull flavor. We also tried, he also tried to do like a, vapor basket and then the flavor was still just like not as full bodied as you wanted it to be and so one of the things that gives us that like fullness of flavor I think is the fact that we're doing direct maceration on the botanicals for about an hour before we start our distillation and that really like helps to like infuse all those flavors and, and give us like a nice full uh, a full palette of all of that. You talked about some things some things you tried to make Mm-hmm. some experiments, so to speak. Being a gin distillery, are seasonal gins or different varieties of gins something that you're considering doing, have considered doing? Is that something that's maybe in the future for Asbury Park Distilling Company? We've thought about it for sure. Um, we've played around with a few. But it's, it's like never say never. We've thought about making gins, like flavored seasonal gins. It's a lot of R&D, and I, we don't know... We haven't gotten anything exactly right yet. So, like, I don't want to say, like, yeah, we're going to come out with something, and then it, it turns out we can't get it to the part, the point that we want it to be at before we release it. But we want everything to be, like, the way we want it before we release it. We will volunteer okay. our services <laughs> to be part of that R&D program. We don't mind. Sure, sure. We'll set up a tasting panel on Fridays in Asbury. Perfect. Fridays in Asbury. <laughs> we are going to be tasting gin and working on the next seasonal gin release here. Sure. <laughs> but let's not lose sight of this wonderful barrel-aged gin. I am a big fan. We're both big fans of barrel-aged gin. How did that come about? So that's actually one of the, like, part of the development of the, like, the lure of the BFG is that... <laughs> Uh, the there was a batch of the Asbury gin when we were developing it that Bill did not he wasn't like crazy about it 
and instead of just letting it go to waste, he put it into a barrel. Um, and it actually turned out really great. It mellows it. It gets like a little bit of that like like marshmallow sweetness, and you get a, you lose a lot of the pininess. So it, it kind of it totally transforms it. There's like a three to four month period that it totally clicks because you can taste like we taste them as it's going the barrels and at like the two month mark it just tastes like gin with a little extra but after like that three month four month period depending on what the weather has been like um it really clicks and it gets this like really like warm character to it um this is actually the spirit that like i was when i was sitting here and talking the bartender's ear off about like everything i could think of um and they were like we should just hire this girl <laughs> <laughs> um, this is the spirit that I was like, I need to, I need to work here. I need to, to talk to the guy who makes this. This is so cool. Um, this is one of my favorite spirits. I'm very fond of it. Um, and I think that's cool. They're both at the same proof. So like really the only difference between these two spirits, because it's the same, it's the same gin. It's just going into a barrel. It's like those, that three to four months that it spends in, in New American Oak. So I think that's super cool. What is super cool is if you've ever watched somebody smoke a cocktail and you see all that smoke in the glass and it's kind of turning around, that's the nose on this. You get this wonderful smoky veil on the nose. You get this marshmallow, freshly toasted marshmallow on the veil, and then that gin comes in. There's that piney note that comes in. And, and, and you get the essence of the wood on here. So you can say, yeah, guess what? This is a barrel aged gin or a BFG as you? Barrel finished gin. Barrel yeah, finished gin. We, we call it BFG for short, just when we're like writing okay. sheets or, or filling out forms. But yeah. Barrel finished gin, BFG. And I'm gonna say this is a BF and deal. I don't know if I can say <laughs> that right. I don't know. But this is so delicious. And again, the ability to express, it sounds like, all right, it was a mistake in the beginning, but it turned out to be a happy accident. It turned out to be a purposeful accident to make this wonderful gin expression. And now you've got the cocktails in the back. And even so, this you could say, all right, we're gonna make a gin old fashioned because at least it comes out with that aging process. What are some of the other cocktails that the bartenders are using to make this one? My favorite drink with a with barrel finished gin is a paper plane. Like I love to play with cocktails that normally would have bourbon in them, but now we put the barrel aged gin. People love to make Negronis with this because it, it, it lands somewhere between a Boulevardier and a Negroni. Um, but yeah, Paper Plane is one of my favorite. It makes a great Vesper, um, like this and, and vodka with a little Lule. Um, I think it has a little bit more di like dimension than a normal Vesper would. Um, but yeah, they've gotten really creative with it. I love the, the barrel finished in old fashion that we make here. I think it's just like a nice, simple cocktail. But. Now, what are the ingredients of a paper plane? Paper plane is normally bourbon, Amaro Nonino, Aperol, and lemon. But if you put the barrel finished gin instead of the bourbon, I really like that. I really like this. And I can certainly see if that next, like, you're almost taking gin to a higher level, a new experience. And again, if you have those people that come in here that are already on guard, I think that this provides that level of it's it's a um, it's a higher level of schooling, in a way, to be able to see what gin possibly can be. Now, these barrels were did they have are they are they new barrels are they old barrels have they had bourbon in them or other spirits in them? Yeah, they're new barrels. So they're, they're the same thirty gallon new American oak barrels that we were using originally to, to age our bourbon. We've sent up to, to 53 gallon barrels for our, our bourbon, but the barrel finished gin is in new American oak for three to four months. And then so that we can repurpose those barrels, we have our contract bourbon that gets finished in those barrels. So we're trying to get a little bit more like sustainability there. I okay. Guess. Yeah, um, so that they, they're not just used for one time for three months. But I find like the, the that marshmallow quality and all that sweetness that you get here. Like I've had people be like, "How much sugar do you add to this?" And it's like, literally none. Um, so 
using the the first fill barrels, I think, gives it a little bit more of that, like that marshmallow and the sweetness in the body. Yeah, I wonder what would have happened if bourbon barrels or ex-bourbon or whiskey barrels were around and that what was used at the time because I think a lot of barrel finished programs that other distilleries are doing do secondary use those use those barrels but this new make barrel nothing's ever been in there and I think that you get the vanillins you get the sugars out of that wood that really makes this very special and this is something that um, you know You've won awards with this. I mean, I think you're probably out of space for hanging, you know, your awards, right? Maybe you're going to need a bigger wall. I don't know. Yeah, maybe we'll just switch out when we win more awards in the future. Yeah, but, I, yeah, we're pretty full on that wall. Our biggest award that we won was for the regular gin. In 2021, we won San Francisco World Spirits Competition, best in class. Um, I thought it was a joke until Bill came in and said, and like had Prosecco. And I was like, hey, let's celebrate. Um, yeah, I thought that someone was punking me. Okay. Um, when that came in. But, yeah, we're, we're still kind of hanging our hat on that one. Um, we haven't entered too many competitions lately. Um, it's expensive, and it's time-consuming. Mm-hmm. And you've got to send, like, what, six bottles, and, uh, you know, there's all kinds of shipping regulations. I mean, things that you have to be very aware of if you're sending something to a competition. Oh, definitely. It's it's definitely like a lot of admin, but I don't know. We'll, we'll definitely like we'll definitely be in competitions in the future just to make sure that we're still cre- like making the same high quality product all the time. Um, that's really important to us is consistency. That's been like the biggest my biggest concern since taking over is like I, I love the products that we have and I want to just keep them at that high caliber. Um, so just making sure that everything's consistent um, has been my biggest thing. I don't want that BFG that made me want to stay here to change, you know? You have the distillery here. You have the tasting room, the cocktail program. I see that there are bottles of Asbury Park Distilling Company throughout some of the other cocktail bars in the city. How do people get a hold of your bottles? Do you ship nationally? Do they have to come here? Are there, I know there are a couple uh, liquor, liquor stores and bottle stores here in Asbury Park. Um, I think Harry's one of them right over here uh, on Cookman. Oh, yeah, Lush. Yeah, Lush. We love them. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and he's got a great program bringing in some, some shout out to Lush and Harry. Um, <laughs> And uh, the, the program that they have going in there. But how do people get a hold of uh, your bottles if they're not in New Jersey? If they're not in New Jersey, so we're working on expanding to other states now. We're only distributed in New Jersey right now, but we are working on getting distributed to a couple other states. Um, we also have, there's a third party supplier that does shipping for us because we're not allowed to do direct to consumer. Um, so they buy from our distributor and they sh- they're allowed to ship, they have a certain license. So on our website, you can get the link to that. Um, and you can just basically order straight through our website. It's just going through a third-party service. Perfect. But if you wanted to pick up bottles here, Asbury Park is a wonderful place to come to. And uh, definitely stop by um, and, 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 and see everybody and pick up as many bottles as you like, right? Yeah, I agree. Okay. I think it's the easiest way to get, uh, get everything you want from us is just to come straight to the distillery. Um, we haven't done any distillery exclusives in a while. We usually think start in the distillery and then they end up at the uh, the distributor, but um, that doesn't mean that there will never be any distillery exclusives. What would be in the mind of Kelly that would be an exclusive that you're thinking about? I, I'm thinking about a lot of things. It's I don't really like to talk about things until they're right, you okay. know? <laughs> Um, because I, like, I have some things in barrels that, like, I, I'm hoping turn out the way I want them to, but you never really know. And so, um, I don't know if I, I don't know if I totally want to tease those things, but, um, there are definitely things that we have in the works. Okay. Let's talk about this whiskey. Okay. Talk about this whiskey. Yeah. So, uh, this is the thing that I'm the most passionate now that I work here. Um, we're using all New Jersey grain, which is really cool. Like, if you're getting grain from a bigger company, it's going to be it's going to be more consistent. But you're also getting it from a lot of different places because it's going through like a grain elevator, um, and like it's 
a bunch of different places and it's not as traceable. Like, I have been to this farm. I know this farmer. I, like, love everything she's doing. Shout out to your farmer. Rabbit Hill Farms in Shiloh, New Jersey. Um, yeah, Hillary there is a, she's a maltster. So she, they're part of the, the craft malt guild. Um, and she does, like, traditional floor malting. So, um... It's really cool to be able to see the, pro- the process and like to like know like exactly where your grain is coming from. Um, and there are definitely some breweries that are using all New Jersey grain, but I don't know if there's any other bourbons that are using all New Jersey grain, which is kind of fun. Um, and it's also been like, we've been using the same mash bill since we started. So it's 62.5% corn, 25% rye, and 12.5% malted barley. Um, we've been using the exact same mash bill. We've tried to up our efficiencies and we've made slight changes to fermentation. Very, like a slight change to the yeast. We used a different strain for the same supplier. Um, but everything's been pretty consistent. Um, some of the barrels have aged obviously in the windows here and now some of them are gonna be aging in the warehouse. So there's some, some variables that have changed. Um, but we're getting like, totally different results from certain barrels and I think that's that's just like the nature of whiskey and it's been a fun little experiment to try and um, learn to blend with that. Um, All of our whiskey when we first released it was two years old and now we're at a point where we're not releasing anything that's younger than four years old Um, and we're doing between you know I think the smallest batch that we did was six barrels and the largest batch we've done had 10 barrels in it, but it will never exceed more than like 250 gallons in a batch. Um, and so there's gonna be flavor drift between batch to batch because we're not selecting for certain flavors, we're selecting for the best barrels that are ready. Um, and so that's been kind of fun to, to kind of take a trip through all the little batches that we have. I have two of every single batch we've done. Um, and there's seven, we're on seven right now. I was looking behind me just to confirm. Yeah. Number seven though, that's huge to watch how things have meandered from how those barrels have imparted flavor, how the whiskey has aged to what you have now. This, I mean, you said you started with 30 gallon barrels and now you're up to 53s. Mm-hmm. And to see as you wait and be patient for that whiskey to do what it needs to do it, it just must be fun as you start to taste through these barrels and say, wow, from, as you said, you know, like we start, I got, I got the first one, I got the second one, I can see how they've, they've grown, but, but these have really started to come into their age, come into their own, so to speak, haven't they? Yeah, it's been a really cool journey. And I think now we're at a point where like, we're trying to learn what, we're trying to just kind of like see what the grain is giving us and what kind of flavors we're getting out of it. And we're trying to just do like low intervention, right? Like we're, we're controlling for trying to get good yields and good efficiency, but we're trying to just kind of see what what we get out of it. And now we're at a point, I think, where we're gonna be looking into what are the things we like that we're not, that we're, we're finding that we're getting out of this and how do we encourage that to happen more? And so that's kind of like been the research that I've been trying to, to do and try and learn about. Um, it's like, how do we now like, push it towards certain flavors. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's been a cool journey. It's my favorite part of the job is just, like, just trying to try all the different barrels and, and work together different blends. There's a wonderful sweetness to this. There's a wonderful, the, the corn. What I find is, I mean, you talked about this and, and the rye content. I get so much floral from the rye. I get so much, um, not so much of the spiciness of the rye, but more of just the grainy component and, and how it mixes with your barley, um, with your malted barley. And it must be very interesting, those conversations, which we're not part of with Rabbit Hill on production and what you're looking for and the flavor profile that you're hoping to get out of it and how they're helping to cultivate that in what goes in your bottle. Yeah, I mean, we were having conversations like they were growing two different strains of rye um, and then they went down to just the, the Danko, which is what we've been using the whole time. It does have that rye spice. When people talk about rye, like the, the number one thing they say is like, well, I like the spice. And we like that. We don't want it to be the only flavor that's that's present, and so we're kind of selecting for that in barrels. 
Um, but it is it is a cool conversation to have with Hillary because I can say like because she's been doing floor malting and she's been doing great work with all of her barley, like we have uh, 30 barrels or so of single malt that we've made and that was that was Bill's recipe, that's something he developed. Um, we are not sure when it's going to be ready because it's in second yeast barrel, so it takes a little bit longer. I think single malt is going to take long, a long time um, to get it really right, um, but we are sitting on a decent amount of those barrels and you know, like I just took a trip to Isla um, for my honeymoon, so I came back and I was like, I want to make a smoky whiskey. And so she's like kind of helping me figure out how to get, we don't have peat in New Jersey, but like what's something that we do have in New Jersey that we can kind of make a smoky whiskey out of. So like it is cool to be able to work directly with her um, and see what we can do with stuff, with what she's got. While you were at the ADI conference, because we saw you down there in Baltimore, did you happen to meet up with Jim Huff of Liberty Paul Spirits? I did not. Okay. All right. We're on the podcast. Shout out to Liberty Paul because they do a good amount of work with peated. Okay. And that might be a good conversation because, you know, being in Western Pennsylvania, they're not peating either, but they make a peated whiskey. And that might be part of the conversation yeah. to see, look, you guys are all a team, you're a family, you know, everybody wants to help each other. I love, you know, I almost want to say, how long do we have to sit in the car? I'll keep feeding the park mobile so I can wait for the single malt to release. <laughs> yeah. Because like you, I thank you. You finally said something you're working on that, yeah. that might be outside of, you know, the normal, you know, flagship expressions that you have. Uh, look, again, we, we, I think we were here for batch number one. We couldn't wait to try it. And to see what you've created now to batch seven is a special whiskey. One of the things that really presents itself about this is there's that sweetness. There's that, um, there's that grain forward, the floral notes that I talked about. But there's, there's this astringency to this. There's the, the, a cherry note to this. There's a smoky note to this, even though that, that's probably coming from the barrel as it's aging. It's almost like, you know, that graduation moment where this whiskey has finally walked across the stage and you can see where it has been studying all these years to get here. <laughs> this is delicious and I can see why this is exciting for you to put your stamp on it. You, you know, you talk about Bill and the uh, inception of the distillery. What do you think is a common theme or a, a common mission statement or, you know, a common, you know, platform to say, all right, this is always going to be Asbury Park distilling. This is our personality. This is how people can say, oh, I, that's what they do. Yeah, I think I think the big thing for us is making spirits that are approachable to people. Like, I know that in business they say, like, never try to make a product for everyone, but we're trying to make high quality spirits that are versatile for cocktails that work in a lot of different ways. And then I think a lot of people will be able to, like, try it and say, I don't usually like gin, but I like this gin. Um, and that, that kind of like spirit is what we're trying to put into our spirits. <laughs> no, I didn't mean to, to make a pun. We are going to, we're going to name the podcast. That's what they're putting our, our spirits into our spirits. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's, yeah. I love it. I love it. Things come out. Who knows yeah. how it's going to work. Speaking of putting spirits into spirits, this glass and what is in this glass is called? Bazam! And you said you were going to yell it, so I'm glad you did. Pizam! I, I, what is Pizam? So Pizam is a pistachio and almond liqueur. Um, it's more fun if you shout it. Um, it's a portmanteau of pistachio and moretto is where the name comes from. Um, but I really love after dinner drinks. Like, that's my favorite thing, but I get really indecisive. Um, so I'm like, oh, do I want a, do I want a whiskey? Do I want a moretto? Do I want a moretto? Do I just want a coffee? What do I want? And so, like, I tried to make something that had, like, a lot, like, kind of, like, in every man's, like, you know what I mean? It's got a little star, it's got a little bit of aniseed, uh, it's got a little bit of or bitter orange, um, cinnamon, allspice, clove, uh, tart cherries, and then we have a, um, we're working with a company who makes a natural almond and pistachio extract that we add to it um and so this is like the first project that i was like i did all of the r d on and i like made this recipe and i brought it to i made i worked with someone for the label and like this was like one thing that i can say is all me um which i think is really cool um it came out like a little over two years ago now so it's i i'm excited about it i think it drinks 
closer to an Amaro, but it smells like an Amaretto. Like it's not super, super sweet. Um, I love it in a Mai Tai. I love it with coffee. I think there's a lot of cool cocktail applications with it, which is like, this is one of those products that was like heavily influenced by like thinking about how it would be used. Um, but yeah. I think one of the wonderful things about this is as you nose it, yeah, you get such an almond, you know, note to it, but then there's this little spiciness to it. Mm -hmm. And when you taste it, you're like, wait, wait, what is that? You know, my nose said one thing, my mouth said another, and you keep wanting to go back to it just to find different flavors to it. And I can see where you would put, like, there's, it's almost like you say, all right, that Amaro, I'm waiting for the bitterness that doesn't come. Mm -hmm. There's a sweetness, but not an overly amount of sweetness. Uh, there's not the high residual sugar aspect. There's not a high viscosity to this. And I can see where this is a little bit of fun to play with in different cocktails. Are there cocktails that specifically have been made with this for the bar? Yeah, so we had a, like a, basically an Amaretto Sour. It's called a crop top. Um, and so <laughs> I've had that. <laughs> Yeah, so that's that's really good. And then the the bar staff makes like an like an herb infused vodka that we call we call it Amaro. Um, it's not totally it's not a product that we sell here, um, but they do a little float of that on top. Um, and so that's that's a fun cocktail that they do here. Um, we haven't done a ton of just Fazam based, but um, I like it kind of on its own sometimes too. That was the most quiet you said Pazam. So. Pazam! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Dawn and I were talking on our way up. And one of the most captivating aspects of the distillery, besides the wall, and when we first came here, we had to take the tour. Do you remember the tour? We don't have to take the tour anymore, but you had to go to the window and, you know, it, it, it was so archaic. Had you been here before? Yes. But well, we still have to take the tour. And I think... You gave us a coin or something that you showed you took the tour. I forget. Um, there was something that signified you took the tour. Yeah, it was one of those weird New Jersey laws that was like, so the big concern with the distillery license is that it's going to compete with bars and restaurants. And I fully understand that people paid an arm and a leg for their liquor licenses. And they don't want to like lose out to people who have a slightly cheaper license, even though it's, a, <laughs> it's not cheap to run a distillery. Um, so like the biggest concern is that they're going to compete with bars and restaurants and so they, they've put a lot of like hoops for us to jump through um, and one of those hoops that we've been able to kind of do away with is the tour and like so if you came into the distillery in order to sit and drink here you had to have taken a tour it was kind of loosely interpreted by different places but we said if you stand by the window and look at everything that's there that's a tour so thankfully we can we've done away with that now like it, it was kind of a hassle when you're like in the weeds and you're, there's like too deep at the bar and someone walks in and you're like, oh, well, I guess I'm giving it to her now. Um, it definitely makes you sweat, but um, yeah, thankfully we don't have to do that anymore. All right, so before you come to the tour, you get this beautiful siren, right? What, who designed this? What's the concept and the labeling? How did that all come about? Yeah, so... I mean, Asbury is one of those places that has so many great artists. And one of the artists that you see a lot of his work around is Porkchop, and he's the guy who designed our logo. Um, her eyes are closed because it's supposed to be like like symbolic of, like, there's, this is a judgment-free zone. There's so many different types of people from all different walks of life in Asbury. And so we wanted to kind of, like, reflect that um, in our logo. So her eyes are closed. She's non-judgmental. She's just, you know... Come as you are. Um, the top of her tiara is supposed to be modeled after the carousel building. It's one of the most iconic buildings in Asbury Park. It's so beautiful. Um, and so that, that tiara is supposed to kind of reflect some of the, the architecture of that. Um, you get a little bit of the juniper branches on the outside and then the, the barley on the sides. Um, but yeah, this is one of my favorite parts of our, our branding is our logo. Porkchop did an amazing job. He's also done a lot of the artwork that's in here. So like all the, the painting that's on the wall and the back bar, that's all him. In the bathrooms, the, the murals that are in there, he did all of that. But he's also done a bunch of work that you see all throughout Asbury. Um, 
he's great. He's awesome. You, you describing that has made this even more special. Knowing that the barley and the juniper and why her eyes are closed and the connection to the carousel building, which hopefully someday will become something again. Yeah. But that makes it even more special. And I think for us, that makes our connection to Asbury Park Distilling even more special. I'm going to keep saying special um, because this is our 200th special podcast. Is there anything we haven't talked about on the podcast today? Anything you want listeners to know more about you or Asbury Park Distilling Company? I think the biggest thing is that we love where we are. We love Asbury Park. And we wanted to make a brand that, like, reflected the place that we're in. It really celebrates the place we're in. It's, like, a really cool... People who understand Bruce Springsteen lore or know Bruce Springsteen lore will know Asbury Park from that. But there, there is so much to who, it. Who? <laughs> he played a show a couple weeks ago. It's here now. You might have heard of That was it. actually last weekend. I mean, yeah. that's, that's how fast time flies. Time flies. Yeah. This, I feel like I'm in a time warp right now in yeah. September. Um, but yeah, so like we've heard about it from him, but like it, there's just so much to it. There's so much history. There's so much culture here. Um, and so we want to create a brand. We wanted to create a brand that really reflects what's there already. And like, if this is your entry to craft spirits, or if this is your entry to Asbury Park, like we want to be a really good representation of that. Um, I hope we do a good job of it. (laughs) You do a phenomenal job. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for being a friend of Fermented Adventure and uh, just being a part of our adventure because, you know, just coming into the space and reflecting on the times that we've had and the bartenders we've met and the cocktails we've enjoyed, um, it, it it just makes our relationship even that much more, I'm gonna say special, um, but what you do every day and the hard work you do, sometimes you never receive back and understand the difference. I mean, it's, let's face it, it's craft spirits, but you make a huge difference in people's lives. You're, the people that are coming here to celebrate, maybe they've had a difficult day, you never know what mood, you're not gonna be judged. Just come to Asbury Park Distilling and understand why we love this place and why we really appreciate all that those partners and those founders that came here and said, hey, let's open up a distillery and see what happens. And what happens is people enjoy this space and what you do. And thankfully, you've got some outdoor space that probably took a while to get going, but you have that too. So you can enjoy the sunshine. You can enjoy being by the water and uh, you could just enjoy everything that's creative and what you do all the time. So Kelly, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for having me. Do we say Pazam one more time? Sure. Pazam!